A very warm good afternoon to one and all present here. I'm Dr. Yash Tiwari, Assistant Professor, School of Law, Jagran Lake City University. It gives me immense uh, pleasure on behalf of JLU School of Law to welcome you all to the International Igniting Mind Lecture Series. The virtual dais today is graced by the presence of Dr. John Ivan Finn, Director of the Non-Profit uh, Center for Global Non-Killing Hawaii. On my personal behalf and on uh, behalf of Jagrin Lake City University, I welcome you, sir. On behalf of uh, School of Law, I welcome all the participants uh, and also all the uh, faculty members and the co-panelists here. So uh, before handing over the platform to the resource person, let me quickly introduce you to uh, the speaker for the day. Uh, Dr. Ivan Spim is director of the non-profit Center for Global Non-Killing Hawaii, an NGO in special consultative status with the United Nations. He also teaches at Abu Academy University's master program in peace, mediation, and conflict research in Vasa, Finland, and at John. John I University master's program in peace, conflicts, and development in Castile. He has published in dozens of books and articles on violence prevention and the development of killing-free societies. He has several edited books in his name, including Non-Killing Education, 2017, Non-Killing Psychology, 2012, Non-Killing Societies in 2010, and Toward a Non-Killing Paradigm. Joam followed graduate and undergraduate studies in journalism anthropology and politics. He served as CJNK communication and research. He has served as a team leader and had previously collaborated with the strategic planning committee formed in 2008 to, the de to develop the organization. Before working for CJNK, he lectured at the University of Santiago de Compostela and directed the Galician Institute for International Security and Peace Studies. Today, he will be speaking on non-killing, crossing the threshold of possibility. Without further ado, I hand over the platform to Dr. Pip. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, um, it's really uh, a great honor to be with you today, especially thank the Dean and the faculty and all the colleagues there and the amazing number of students. Now I see almost 400 attending this session. So also congratulations for all of you to, to be able to put together such a wide audience in these difficult times for teaching, for gathering, and for sharing ideas. Um, it would have been a privilege to, to be with you there today and, and to get to, to know better all the great work that you've been doing at the university for these years. Uh, in, at the Center for Global Non-Killing, we're, we're very, really honored to have this ongoing partnership with, univer with the university. And um, I guess there will be exciting news uh, over the next few weeks on, on that growing collaboration. Um, I think this is an important time for all of us to stop and think about the importance of, of life. It's been a year of a um, lot of turbulence in which life has um, gone back to the center of our discourse and our thinking uh, globally as a society um, because of disease, because of pandemic, um, because of police violence and other events that have been taking place. So I'm really honored also that the university has thought that this would be a, an important topic for us to be discussing in this moment. Um, I would like to also honor uh, my mentor, Professor Glenn B. Page, who actually has a, an honorary doctorate from your university, if he, he was on, given to him a few years ago before he he passed away. Um, and um, Glenn, of course, is the founder of the Center for Global Non-Killing, which, as it was said, is a, is a global institution which is focused, which is strongly dedicated to bring about change and to think about how can societies which are free of killing be developed uh, in, in every corner of the world and in international society. Um, Page himself was a political scientist, very much interested in law, but also in any other discipline. 
and a, a strong believer in how uh, disciplines needed to get together to think about and to solve uh, crucial problems of our time. And he was in the understanding that uh, killing is a major uh, problem that our societies need to think over from different perspectives. Um, Glenn uh, Page, Professor Glenn Page, would also say that science starts by asking questions, by asking different questions, and sometimes by trying to bring, come up with, with uh, different answers that can help us um, develop new, new solutions. Um, and this is, he would always start um, lectures or seminars by asking a very simple question, which is actually this, the question with which he starts up his seminal book, uh, Non-Killing Global Political Science, which I really invite you all to, to read at some point. And um, I'm sure there will be copies in the library, but also it, it's, it's on uh, the internet, uh, in PDF, and all of you can have access, Non-Killing Global Political Science. And that book, and Professor Page in all of his lectures would start out by asking the following question. Are non-killing societies possible? Are societies in which people do not kill each other a possibility? And in the lecture like this, he would ask, usually ask the audience now over 400 to um, raise their hands and take a vote. Uh, yes or no depending on their own beliefs. We won't try to do, this, do it today with the audience, but I would ask you all to internally take a few seconds to reflect about that question. Are non-killing societies possible? Are societies in which individuals do not kill each other, where the threat of killing is not the condition for maintenance of social conditions or for changing uh, social conditions or organization or economic system, at a given time. And I think as lawyers or, or law students, or uh, you will be interested in this, in this key question, uh, regardless of what rep response you come up with, regardless of if you think it is possible or if, it, or if it's not possible, there isn't a correct answer for this. But when you, th when you think about it, and I hope you all reach the, your own conclusions, I think it's also important to understand what are the reasons behind our belief on this initial question, if it's possible or if it's not possible? And by this set of beliefs, um, this is what I would call the threshold of possibility, right? And, and that's why it's very important to address this threshold. Um, if we wouldn't have time today to go through all the reasons that over 400 of you have probably came up with, and they will likely be very important reasons both to consider uh, non-killing societies as something which is just unimaginable or impossible or um, not something of this world, or on the other hand, strong grounds that you might think can make these societies a reality at some point in the future. Um, but I think what you all just have done, what we all have done together is a very important first step. And I go back to science starts with questions. And unless we start making different questions, it's very unlikely that we, we will move towards uh, any alternative solutions. And this is true for disease, it's true for climate change, it's true for uh, divisions between um, ethnicities, ideologies of race, um, economic inequalities in the world. Unless we start making different questions, it's very unlikely we will reach uh, different answers to those that have already sunken us into certain problems that are, appear to be unsolvable. Now, many of you, when, when considering the question and when considering the, the reasons for uh, one option and, or another, may have possibly um, uh, thought about the issue of human nature, right? Um, non-killing societies not being possible because humans being inherently prone to lethal violence, prone to war, prone to um, escalated aggression and conflict, right? This is a very common belief um, that comes up in this kind of discussions. And the human nature debate is a very old debate, as students of law will know. This goes back to the debate of Hobbes and Rousseau, which is actually on the foundation of uh, 
of our modern societies, of our modern state, and philosophy of law, the philosophy of politics. Uh, and it's a debate that will go on and on probably for a very long time, uh, sometimes without enough um, common ground to, to discuss possible solutions. But above all, the human nature debate and the, and the general status of what uh, us as global societies and in general as, as in each country, in each particular society, the set of beliefs uh, regarding this important question is usually um, taken us to the grounds that uh, humans are indeed inherently prone to, to, to violence, to killing, uh, to war, as a, as a kind of an, uh, an inevitable part of human condition, of human nature. Now, this, um, this belief, which is uh, apparently philosophical in terms, is actually extremely problematic. And this is something that the Center for Global Non Killing we've been uh, working on for many years, because it's this belief on the inevitability of uh, of human uh, escalated aggression of human killing, which strongly hampers the development the development of alternatives. It's very difficult to work for something or to work for certain change if you believe that that change is impossible. Um, just let me illustrate this by a few numbers that will help us understand uh, where our global priorities as a society stand at this point. Now, um, you're all likely familiar that there's a lot of military research and development, which is research aimed at uh, identifying new weapon systems or improving them or um, addressing security threats and so forth. Um, at the moment, military research and development has five times more resources globally in terms of funding than uh, healthcare research. So there's five times more funding globally going to military research than to research to prevent disease, uh, to address pandemics like the ones we're living this year, which causes um, all the situation we you, you all know about, but it, it's it's also very telling that uh, military research and development um, pours ten times more funding, research and development funding, than food and agriculture related research. So this is a research which can help us um, feed the world, uh, prevent uh, famine and address uh, other very life-threatening issues, right, uh, that our world is facing. And all in all, there's about uh, just over half a million scientists in the world which are dedicated to military health and development, sorry, to, to military research and development. And this says a bit, I guess, about our global priorities and where are we putting the focus of uh, human need and where our priorities as a global society should be. I usually have another example that I like to quote on allocation of resources that has to do with this uh, cultural views on where do we need to focus our attention. Now, you all are, you are all familiar with the Pentagon, right? Um, as a, an institution and as a building, I guess. And um, approximately 20,000 people, just over 20,000 people, working this single building uh, every day. And now I usually ask people to uh, tell me about how many people they think uh, work at uh, the World Health Organization's unit to prevent violence. Uh, the World Health Organization has become quite famous over the past uh, few months, uh, famous or infamous, depending on who's, whose views, but um, the World Health Organization also does, and has been doing for, for more than a decade, uh, a great uh, work in, in, in addressing another global disease, another global pandemic, which is that of violence. And for that purpose, the WHO is as a division on violence and injury pre prevention. And within that division, there's a unit on violence prevention. So this is the global, uh, a global institution um, that is focused and tasked on 
preventing and addressing uh, a global pandemic that every year takes about 1.6 million lives, 1.6 million die a year of intentional killing. Um, so I usually ask people, how many people, how many uh, individuals do you think work at the World Health Organization's Violence Prevention Unit? compared to the 20,000 that you have, for example, in the Pentagon every day. Some people say 500, some, some people say 1,000. I'll keep you wondering for a bit. We would do a vote and see who wins, who gets the closest. But to cut it short, it's 2.5 people. So it's two full-time workers, one part-time worker in the global uh, unit that addresses this global pandemic that takes 1.6 million lives a year. Of course, there's many other people working on violence prevention around the world, but the, the, the divergence of resources that are dedicated globally, nationally, or even locally, you know, you could take a municipality as an example of what goes into uh, coercive approaches to address violence and how much actually is going to prevent it before it happens. And the divergence is colossal, it's enormous, right? Um, so this might have to change if we want alternative solutions. And we might, and this ha may have to do with not only policies, but also addressing these deeper cultural assumptions that are behind, um, behind uh, our social choices in terms of where we put our uh, resources, but above all, what we think is possible and what we think is not possible, and which really conditions are uh, the solutions and the measures we take as societies. So now let's uh, come into anthropology, which is actually my, my own research background and the way I've been working on this topic for a few years now. Um, but before we go into anthropology, I would like to quote um, a well-known economist um, and also peace activist, Kenneth Boulding. And there's, there's a statement by Kenneth Boulding that some, I think it was later called uh, Kenneth Boulding's First Law or something uh, more fancy like that. But it was basically uh, the principle of that anything that exists is possible. And when addressing this question that Professor Page put on non-killing societies, anthropology usually has a quite straightforward answer because anything that exists already is definitely possible. And I would invite you to explore, whenever you have a few moments, uh, a very interesting resource that you will find on the internet, which is the Encyclopedia of Peaceful Society. This is a uh, freely available collection of around 25 societies in the world that have been defined by anthropologists as being peaceful, which usually means having uh, from very little to no violence at all in their um, in their social uh, society, in their social organization, in their, within their societies. Now, the encyclopedia just selects uh, selects 25 examples in the world. And I was checking it this, this morning, and there's actually five, five of these 25 societies are in, in India. And you might have then special interest to look at these uh, societies. I won't even there to spell the names, but that will give you more incentive to go and check. Uh, the societies are all across India, from north to south, east to west. Um, so there's pl plenty of examples. Some are nomadic, some are agriculturist or, or horticulturalist. <clears throat> so there's a, there's a diversity in this. And um, so when, when we have this, these usually very heated discussions on human nature, uh, which usually follow the question we start with today, these, uh, these set of societies that still, still exist today, which have uh, no to no violence, no killing, or or, or very very little amount of, of this kind of social behaviors, are really challenges in um, believing uh, or in sustaining these views on 
violence being uh, an inherent part of human nature, of let's say our human uh, hardware, if you like, or evolutionary um, wiring. Yeah? And many of these, so these societies, and of course the 25 societies in the encyclopedia are just a sample, have very diverse social forms of organization. <clears throat> but they do have in common uh, um, to have a set, a very um, a wide set of tools for conflict resolution, for conflict management that are used on a daily basis. And some of these societies also have an ethos of peacefulness. So for them uh, to be peaceful uh, in their relations with others and among the group is an important part of the self-image. There's also, of course, um, important aspects in their social organization uh, in terms of uh, lack of inequalities within the society, the societies being relatively egalitarian, uh, economies usually involving uh, sharing. Um, also, many important issues that have to do, have to do with um, child raising, with what today we would call early childhood education, which actually show a pattern. And this pattern has been uh, addressed and studied by um, anthropologists, developmental psychologists, educators, they have tried to find, so what is it we're getting, uh, we're not getting right in our uh, contemporary societies? And what is it we could maybe learn from uh, these the examples of peaceful societies that are around the world? And interestingly, there's a lot of overlap between uh, some of the ideas that have come up with these uh, this study of peaceful societies and the conclusions we've seen in in fields such as neuroscience, uh, in psychology, for example, uh, that address the same the same underlying issues. And I would like to just men go out of the way of anthropology now for a little bit uh, and move towards uh, um, the archaeological record, right? And the question we started with today: Are non-killing societies possible? Could actually be reframed. We could ask if um, uh, are societies without war possible, right? And war is another instrument of um, to solve conflicts that is been, has been around for quite a while. But many people believe that just as non-killing societies are not possible, they also believe that societies without war are not possible, and usually with a very similar set of arguments. And among these arguments is that war has been uh, is part of human nature. Right? War has been with us uh, since the beginning of times, and therefore it will continue to be with us. And therefore, uh, the investments in military research and development instead of health and food related research make complete sense. So does the way in which national budget budgets go and how our focus uh, is in terms of addressing international disputes. Now, However, again, in this case, archaeology brings a bit of a problem for this for this um, for this assumption, and the and the problem lies with uh, that warfare has a very distinct <coughs> track or a very distinct um, trace, sorry, within within the archaeological record, and in fact, by by now we know that the first instances instances of war that occur. Uh, in human societies are very recent in terms of our uh, evolutionary history as a species. And by recent, uh, we mean around 12,000 <coughs> 12, years ago in the case of uh, Mesopotamia. So in the case of the first transitions into the Neolithic uh, with the agricultural uh, revolution. Um, and of course, much later in other parts of the world, talking around 6,000 years ago in the Indian subcontinent, uh, around 3,000 3, years ago in Northern Europe, or 2,500 years ago in Central America. And if you compare this uh, very uh, recent event, so the very recent emergence of, of warfare uh, among human uh, societies, and you compare it to over 150,000 years of 
uh, evolutionary history as a species, in which we actually live in social conditions and social forms of organization that were very similar uh, to those of some of the 25 peaceful societies that uh, this encyclopedia uh, refers, uh, we see there's actually a human pattern of peaceful organization that was actually disrupted rather recently in terms of, uh, of our, our time as, as a, our evolutionary time as a species, very recently. So between 2,500 and 12,000 years ago, depending on what region of the earth uh, we live in. And of course, um, it's also true that um, changes, the very radical changes that, um, that the transitions to the Neolithic, that agricultural revolution uh, brought with, such as the end of nomadic lifestyle, the beginning of settlements, um, the beginning of uh, accumulation of goods in terms of economy. This is usually framed by the differences between immediate return economy and delayed return economy. So like in hunter-gatherers where you hunt or gather and immediately consume whatever uh, goods you acquire. And they, that's, that also explains the sharing economies that many of these uh, societies have because it's not possible to, to keep these goods for long. In contrast with the delay return economies of agriculture, of uh, grain cultivation, which requires planning, storage, uh, uh, between years even, and sometimes even longer terms. The, this, of course, brings about accumulation. And with, the, with, the, with the millennia, as millennia went by with uh, social, forms of, uh, social forms of organization that include, included stratification, hierarchy, increased social inequality, um, monopoly in, in the trade of, uh, of uh, prestige goods, and a lot of things that, you know, if you're interested in history or archaeology, you will, you will be familiar with. Now, uh, the interesting thing is in some of these areas where we've seen these transitions into the Neolithic throughout the millennia, warfare did not appear or did not, was not the kind of a, uh, sustained in time. And of course, um, there's then instances where much more recent, where we actually see um, records for the establishment of permanent military institutions of a class of warriors and societies, which is then, of course, uh, a sign of, of how uh, this escalated aggression has become institutionalized in societies. But again, um, as, a, as a species, as cultures, we've shown very clearly uh, of what we're capable. Uh, this is not to say humans, of course, are not capable of waging warfare. They are. They are capable of inventing nuclear weapons. Um, but this is different from arguing and from taking a viewpoint when we're asking this kind of questions that uh, these behaviors are kind of an inherent part of our human nature rather other than rather than um, cultural creations and in this point i would like to introduce you a very important document that was approved by unesco in 1986 and this is, document is the civil statement on violence a civil statement on violence and this is a, now a document uh, more than 30 years old, but that made the point that um, uh, escalated uh, human aggression and violence and war are not the product of any, uh, of any uh, let's say, innate human tendency, but it's the direct result of culture. And culture can be changed and culture shifts, and it shifts actually very rapidly. And even uh, very deeply held beliefs, uh, for example, on um, that sustained institutions that have lasted for millennia, like slavery, uh, like the oppression of, of women in societies, have changed very rapidly over the past of um, century or even less. Um, so there's no reason why this institution of warfare, which is a cultural product of our societies, or um, the, the belief that um, 
violence is an appropriate form to address human conflicts is in any way inevitable or is in any way something that cannot be shifted, cannot be uh, changed. Now, this is something that um, military psychologists know and they know it very well because it's their, uh, it's their basic job, right? There's one military psychologist I like to quote, just to make sure it's, I'm not quoting, or I'm not referring to, um, uh, to sources, to researchers that are more, maybe more aligned with this view of uh, uh, a need to articulate change. But uh, um, I like to refer to the work of a, of a, a US military psychologist, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Dave Grossman, who has a very interesting book I would suggest every lawyer to read at some point. Uh, the book title is On Killing, On Killing. And um, basically, as a military psychologist, um, Dave Grossman, uh, Lieutenant Grossman, had uh, two basic missions. One mission was to get uh, normal individuals that uh, become part of the military forces to kill when ordered to do so. That's a basic task of a soldier at some point. And uh, uh, however <clears throat> conditioned we might be by our, by our social views of violence being acceptable or desirable or a human, a basic part of, of uh, let's say our human brain, uh, and other views of this kind. Uh, in fact, uh, getting people to kill is an extremely difficult mission uh, for military psychologists. And um, in, in this book uh, the, on killing, uh, Grossman makes uh, uh, a story of how over uh, the last century and a half, uh, military institutions have had to really refine their training, uh, and how they conditioned individuals so they would actually fire when asked to do so to shoot at their adversaries in the field. And contrary to popular belief, this, this wasn't actually happening. Uh, and, there's, and he mentions the findings from the American Civil War, from the First World War, from the Second World War, where uh, over 95% of the soldiers in the front line would have an extreme aversion to actually uh, killing uh, their opponents when ordered to do so. And I have a personal uh, story uh, with this, uh, which I only understood much later in life, but my, my, my grandfather was a combatant in the Spanish Civil War between 36 and 39. And when I was a child, he would tell me that when they were in the front lines uh, in different, in different um, camps, of course, in, in different sides of the front lines, both the, the soldiers in his uh, trench and the soldiers in the other trench would systematically shoot to miss each other when they were ordered to shoot. They would all, I either shoot above the heads or, or, or shoot below. And I only understood the significance of this when I read uh, Rossman's book on killing, that this has actually been the, the, the normal human behavior and even in the in in this in the midst of this institution like the military and you would imagine this has been a, a problem for centuries ever since as a as a human uh, species we invented uh, warfare anyway grossman discusses how particularly after the second world war the military have really advanced the technologies uh, for uh, conditioning for uh, uh, training um, to make it almost an instinctive, uh, an automatic reaction, right? When ordered to do so, a very uh, immediate reaction. Uh, he discusses how in the 70s, the US Marine Corps introduced uh, um, the one person shooter video games, right? As a way of advanced simulation that would trigger these reactions uh, without engaging parts of the brain that would otherwise uh, make it difficult. But anyway, uh, he explains how uh, basically uh, as an institution, the military has have really had to work hard to overcome the very deep resistance that humans have 
uh, to engage in, in, in killing, killing other humans. And of course, a lot of this military research and development that this half a million scientists are still doing today has now a lot more to do with uh, distance, killing from the distance, drone warfare, and um, other kinds of engagement in battle, which do not necessarily involve um, having eye-to-eye -eye contact with an adversary, which, which has also always been extremely problematic. Now, the other side of this, of the mission of military psychologists has to do with the aftermath, uh, with how to, put, how to cope, how to manage the consequences, the fallout, the psychological fallout of having uh, normal individuals engaging in killing. Um, now, those of you who are more or less familiar with psychology would have heard of uh, post-traumatic stress disease, um, which is a series of symptoms that has to do with uh, trauma. And one of these subtypes is those have, that has to do with violent trauma, uh, either as a victim or as a perpetrator. And um, you've all likely heard about how, even from films, especially from the Vietnam era, how post-traumatic stress disease is a very common uh, a psychological issue of war veterans. And this is a problem, of course, all around the world, and a problem also that military psychologists have to manage. And uh, there's another interesting uh, work which was produced by another psychologist, Rachel McNair. And she identified a particular subtype of a post-traumatic stress disorder, which she called perpetrator-induced traumatic stress, perpetrator-induced traumatic stress. And this was, uh, she basically came to the conclusion that perpetrators of killing, and her study involved uh, soldiers, policemen, uh, exec ex executionists, right, in, uh, particularly in the US with the death penalty. And she found that uh, perpetrators uh, would have um, much more severe symptoms of post-traumatic stress uh, disorder, sorry, uh, not disease, than, um, than victims. And this also challenges this idea of our innate depravity, of our um, biological conditioning to be killers, to engage in warfare. And both Grossman, McNair, and many others have found that it's actually a very small minority uh, in the case of soldiers, of people who had previous uh, conditions of, uh, of previous psychopathology, psychopathic behavior, which would not suffer either, which would not have this uh, reluctance to kill and also uh, not likely suffer this uh, psychological uh, um, fallout. And of course, from a criminology perspective, which you might be interested in, this also has to do with uh, the psychopathic behaviors or personalities, which of course also become an issue in, in society and in terms of behavior they can engage in. Now, I'm not sure how we're doing in terms of time or if you would need to shift the format. I can go on for <laughs> I can go on for quite a long time, but if at any point you would like to interrupt me and uh, have uh, so uh, any we, other issue. So we can have uh, the your lecture for uh, some 15 minutes more and thereafter okay. we will begin the question in uh, Q&A session. Okay, that's yeah. that's fantastic. So so anyway, I just want to mention a few small things before we, we end. And I know I, I uh, it's a bit difficult to follow sometimes very long lectures from a distance, and it's not as it's difficult to engage when you're not uh, uh, looking at each other. So I'll, I'll I'll try to keep it. Uh, I won't go long for much longer. But just a few ideas that I think are important and that might be useful for you as, as law students and faculty maybe to, to consider. Uh, one has to do, and going back to anthropology and hunter-gatherers, about some of the findings that has to do with the importance of parenting practices and early childhood education, and how this has to do with preventing uh, this kind of psychopathic behaviors at a later, later stage in human life. 
And to explain this is not enough to address simple hunter gatherers. We actually have to go about four million years ago, when the first um, when the first uh, when the process of hominization started with Australopithecus, and we started. Um, I say we, but of course it's, it wasn't even humans at that point. But there was a process of bipedalism, right? Of um, of walking, starting to walk on on two uh, on two feet. And with the pass of these four million years, and with the arrival of Homo sapiens sapiens, this led to a particular situation which is quite peculiar among mammals, which is that human babies are born prematurely compared to other uh, other mammals. It has to do with this, precisely with this bipedalism, with this walking on two feet and the, the changes this has on the, on the way our, our, our body uh, is set up, it's laid out. And this, of course, this premature birth of human babies is extremely important because it, it, it means that uh, for the first years of life, um, human babies are not fully developed. And this includes a lot of aspects of our uh, circuitry, of our hardware, but it's particularly uh, in terms of brain development. So a lot of the brain circuits that has to do with, um, with empathy, with compassion, or if uh, wired incorrectly with, with precisely this kind of psychopathic behavior that Grossman found among under five percent of um, people engaged as soldiers in the army uh, that were ready to kill uh, when asked to do so. Uh, this involves a very particular set of, of conditions, we ha which has to do with our cultural practices of rearing human babies, and this is why uh, a lot of work has now been done on understanding these differences and what is it we're doing different in. in in many of our contemporary industrial societies, that might explain the, the, the sometimes the growing amounts of um, psychopathic behavior that is not uh, is not so is not normal in in in, in other groups. Um, so for this, there's a there's one scholar I would um, I would suggest you take a look up is uh, Darshan Arvais. I can maybe then offer a list of, of the names in case you're interested. Developmental psychologists very much focused on understanding how child rearing practices influence uh, our brain development, the, the conditions of, uh, of being uh, empathic uh, individuals or actually can, in, can lead to very different outcomes. And now uh, just a, a few final ideas, which I think are important. One is collaboration. And of course, this is a huge issue, a huge challenge uh, to shift, to understand and shift the conditions which, which are making human killing so prominent in our societies. One emergent field, which I would really call you to, to look at and even become engaged is that of violence prevention uh, through a, a violence, uh, sorry, through a, public health approach. And again, we're in a year with, in which public health and epidemiology has become prominent, but I would also invite you to understand some other approach, some other questions that public health has engaged with. Engaged in. Violence prevention is a field that has started particularly after 2002 with the publishing of the, the World Health Organization report on violence and health. And it, this involves uh, not only uh, um, maybe the name would, would take us to the stake, but not only health practitioners, but also criminologists, people from other social sciences, law, people focusing on criminal justice system, educators. And basically what uh, the World Health Organization and what the field of violence prevention has come up with is that violence is something like a preventable disease that spreads like a disease and that can be addressed with a similar knowledge that we have in public health uh, to address other diseases, to stop transmission and, uh, and to address and to have a, pre a preventive approach for, uh, for to, prevent, to, to stop, let's say, uh, fatalities down the line. And um, very interestingly, this approach that violence prevention has is focused on evidence-based solutions. 
Glenn Page, Professor Page, um, would say we probably already know enough to bring about radical change in terms of uh, the amount of killing which is taking place in our society. This is um, reminiscence of um, some other uh, human challenges that were the result of this accumulation of knowledge for an, an extraordinary goal. And Professor Page would usually refer to two examples. One, of course, is uh, the invention of nuclear weapons in the context of the Second World War, which involved a huge mobilization of scientists, of funding uh, to develop an extraordinary weapon that was only theoretically imaginable at the time. Only, but that it's, that's a very important issue. So in this context, uh, the, the nu a nuclear weapon was created through the mobilization of science skills, uh, support political will, right? For a very destructive purpose. A few decades after the goal of reaching the moon, right, was uh, imagined and uh, science, skill, uh, technical capacity, political will, funding were put together to send humans to the moon. Glenn Page and the World Health Organization today and many scholars throughout the world are now convinced that we have the knowledge to uh, end killing in our time, but it's the same issue. We need to mobilize science, skills, political will, and, and of course funding to make it happen. A few years ago, there was a conference at Cambridge University. Um, you can find the, the conclusions of that conference, but it was something like how to, what was it? Of how to reduce violence by 50% globally in 30 years. And this is the kind of extraordinary goals we need to set ourselves locally, in our local communities, nationally, regionally, globally. And fortunately, we've started to do this. Uh, and uh, you're all probably familiar yeah. with the Sustainable Development Goals, right? So, which were adopted in 2015 to replace the earlier um, Millennium Development Goals. And among these goals, for the first time, there's a goal 16 to build peaceful and inclusive societies. And the first target of that goal, target 16.1, is to significantly reduce homicide rates and associated deaths everywhere. So for the first time, to build uh, Non-killing societies, or at least less killing societies, is a global goal. Um, all the states in the planet have committed to work in that direction. I think we all have a personal interest uh, not to be killed, and hopefully not to kill anybody else because of the psychological fallout we're now also aware of. So uh, I think was this a question of shifting our cultural assumptions, not letting these assumptions and cultural biases condition us in um, believing something is possible or not possible, bringing about good science to make us do, ask new questions to old problems and try to develop new solutions, new approaches. And just to end, I would like to bring up um, future studies. Um, future studies is a discipline uh, which has always stressed, and since early works in future studies like those of Fred Pollack, a Dutch social scientist, would also stress how our images of the future condition our action in the present. And um, this is, of course, very popular in management studies, which I also engage with. But unless we're able to um, shift our images of the future, it's very unlikely we will be able to engage in meaningful action for social change in the present. If uh, any of you takes a look at um, entertainment or fiction, which is usually a way uh, social scientists that are dressed, are engaged in future studies, try to understand what visions a particular society at a particular time has of their futures, right? Uh, that's how they try to understand, to analyze. And if you look at films about the future, 
uh, television, fiction, series, whatever about the future, books, uh, it's always uh, dystopian. It's always futures that has to have to do with disease, zombie apocalypses, alien invasions, uh, nuclear warfare. And this says a lot. Uh, it's fiction, of course, but it says a lot about our images as a society, as a global society, as contemporary industrial societies, about the futures and what the future holds. And every time in our recent history, every society at every time has a slightly different perception of the future. And in the 50s, visions of the future were very optimistic, um, a lot to do with technology, but also with living better lives. Now our visions of the future are very grim. And uh, other future studies uh, people have emphasized how we need to drive, we need to develop positive images of the future, preferred futures. And, and it's that image, it's those images of the future that serve as a compass for our action in the present. So I think this, um, this need to rethink, uh, to rethink our, um, this issue of human nature and our beliefs, our cultural assumptions, bias and beliefs on, on the inevitability of violence is also important to shift our views on the, fut of the, on the future, our preferred ideas and visions of the future. And this can really motivate us and guide us to bring about change in the present. So with this message, I would just like to end and maybe uh, hopefully be able to engage in a bit of a discussion with all of you. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for sharing your uh, rich experience in this area. You rightly pointed out non-killing as the uh, global pandemic and uh, very beautifully you explained and uh, you uh, interrelated uh, the subject with anthropology, psychology. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, over to you, Katyaini, ma'am, uh, for... Uh, question answer session. Okay, so a very good afternoon, Jean. Uh, first, I just want uh, to understand the difference between non-violence and non-killing as we have been discussing this concept, this idea that uh, many scholars have also pointed out that when there is this concept of non-violence and peace already existing, why should we go for non-killing? So I yes. would like, yeah. So hopefully non-killing will be uncomfortable. And the reason non-killing is probably uncomfortable to many is precisely this uh, cultural bias that we have as societies. Um, I'm a big, um, I'm a big supporter of nonviolent action. Um, and, uh, and the possibilities of nonviolent as a way to bring about social change. And I think uh, nonviolence as a technique for struggle, for intense social struggle as it emerged in, in India, is, is the future way ahead for social transformation. There's some recent works that really stress how uh, nonviolent action is much more successful than armed insurgency in bringing about complex social change. However, non-killing is, is, um, is, is, is complementary to peace, it's complementary to non-violence, but it has a very sharp focus. Um, and you will likely find, um, of course, peace has, is, not a, is, a, is a Western um, Greek concept, which is particularly abstract. And this also helps for uh, basically any ideology be willing to support peace, right? Um, it, it's very abstract. And uh, uh, for example, you will find uh, there's a long scholarly tradition of, uh, especially in the West, for just war theory. Um, now this is called the responsibility to protect which uh, all, which legitis, legitimizes the use of uh, killing in particular, bring about peace. Um, Non-killing is basically about ruling out the possibilities of to kill, right? In, 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 in any society and in any aspect of social organization from not having weapons designed to kill 
to uh, not having any condition in society that relies on killing for maintenance or that has to be changed uh, through killing. And um, to some extent, it also is also less demanding that some concepts and some approaches of, of nonviolence in the sense that, for example, non-killing would uh, be able to consider, um, let's say, in, at least in a transition way, <clears throat> the, the use of, of, of non-lethal weapons, right? You could maybe consider situations, and a lot of the non-killing, the way that Glenn Professor Page presented it, has a lot to do with problem solving. If we have the time at the beginning to go through the, the reasons why each of you thought um, non-killing is not possible or is possible, it's likely that the idea would come up, okay, so you have a, a terrorist, you have someone attacking you, what do you do? You can't use non-violence, right? Or maybe, or maybe that's the, the, the argument. Non-killing would say, well, the principle is that you, we, we, we cannot kill, and therefore you might have to develop technological solutions that would enable you uh, to solve this problem of someone attacking, of someone um, being willing and ready to, uh, to kill many people. But if we have the assumption that non-killing is not an option, then that leads to the, 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 this wonderful thing, which is human creativity, to bring about alternative solutions. It's not just having policemen with guns that will shoot anybody who, who is thought to be, you know, might, might actually engage in, in hurting or stealing or whatever. And there are examples in the world where there's unarmed police. And this, of course, is, is an issue of, of, of uh, shifting on, on, the accepting, on the acceptance of killing as a way to solve issues. And of course, non-killing, therefore, um, pushes us to, to move a bit further, to ask for to bring about new solutions that, for example, uh, can stop someone from uh, attacking or, or exploding a bomb, but in a way which does not involve um, uh, killing that person. And of course, this may not be coherent with the nonviolent principles, right, which are yeah. a bit more demanding. Yeah. Uh, but let's say non-killing would would uh, as a as a as a problem-solving approach, maybe not as a philosophy, but at least as a problem-solving approach, would um, consider ways which might be considered violent, right, as a non-lethal weapon, uh, to to address this this issue of uh, of, of threats of, of killing, which will certainly continue to exist. Okay. And uh, so uh, in your lecture, you also mentioned about that killing was a culture that was gradually learned by the people. So that means initially it did not exist. And as uh, Paige also says that there is a killing funnel in which people gradually learn to uh, adhere to the principles of killing and finally they also began to kill. So I wanted you to uh, elaborate on that killing funnel also, which was mentioned by Page in his book. So both Professor Page and um, many anthropologists, neuroscientists, psychologists would be in agreement that killing is culturally acquired, right? Yes. Of course, we have we have the physical. Um, capacity or at least partial capacity to, to kill. However, we do know we, we also have this, uh, what you could argue is a biological or at least a hardwired uh, resistance to kill, at least in for most, the immense majority of individuals. And then of course the question is, and this is again the, the funnel the, of the, the social conditioning zone, the cultural conditioning zone, where humans uh, learn to kill and learn to accept killing. And for this, there's a very basic exercise we can all do, which is go to our history books and look at how we, how the history of our countries, of our states, of our, um, you know, how of the whole world, how is it presented? 
and history still is very much a succession of wars, of overthrowing uh, rulers, usually through violence. And of course, we learn very little about uh, other ways of change, and of course, ab about normal human behavior, which is usually not not have anything to do with, with killing. Most most people in the world never kill, and have never killed. And this, of course, is completely overlooked by biased history, which is uh, obsessed with with violence, just like anthropology was obsessed with warfare until not so that so long ago. And uh, this is and this, of course, in terms of the, the way of thinking that um, Glenn Page uh, initiated, is the question of again, what questions do we make? What questions do we ask as scientists, but also as individuals in, in critical individuals in our society? Um, what questions we ask, what data we look at, um, what methodologies we use is, is completely relevant. And of course, if we're stuck with the same old questions, if we don't ask new questions, if we don't like ask, look at new data, like for example, we look, we can look at these five Indian societies which are listed in the Encyclopedia of Peaceful Societies and really take, take it seriously to understand what is it about these five societies in India, as an example, that makes them uh, or that made them in, in, in until you know, recent social changes to not have uh, any killing in their society. Or we could do this if we compare the countries in the world or the states in India and or municipalities or other other or other kinds of of uh, administrative divisions, and we try to understand because the statistics are there. Killing killings are can be counted. You can count the bodies, and usually uh, in the, the difference with other forms of violence that usually go kind of under the radar or beneath the, the visible part of the iceberg is that they're not usually looked at. But we can we can see the differences, the very sharp differences in killing uh, between areas, between neighborhoods, between regions, between countries. And of course, we're not asking the right questions. Why are these, why are there such big differences? What make what makes two neighboring uh, municipalities have uh, extremely different uh, rates of homicide, for example? And I think this is also a question that criminologists need to engage in, but having this broader understanding of the mechanisms for, for, for human violence. So um, I really invite you to try and open your minds to, to look at uh, these problems from a different perspective, uh, to look, to ask different questions, to look at different data. Um, and you know, it, it's really mind blowing. We could do this if we had more time. If you look at the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, they have statistics for homicide globally. And I would also suggest all of you to, to check and to compare the homicide rates between country and regions. And you would be amazed to see, for example, Macau, the autonomous region of China, with uh, I think 300 or 500,000 people with zero killings, zero homicides. Or Norway or Iceland, I think, had, it's a country of around 200,000, has a maybe one homicide in a year. And you compare this with regions, you know, in, in um, Central America, for example, that have extremely high homicide rates. So this variability, this, there's such great differences in society should lead us to critically revise these ideas of inevitability of, of, human, um, of human killing and rather think, so what is it? What are the differences? Check Singapore, for example, um, and how, the homicide rates have been going down since the 1950s, where it had one of some of the highest homicide rates in the world, to now being almost insignificant, insignificant having years with, with zero killings or with one homicide, maybe. So it, it, we really need to pay attention to these shifts and um, try to understand and make the right questions. And of course, try to learn from what uh, others may be doing in, in other parts of the world or in other parts of our country, which is helping to put an end to this, this global pandemic of, of violence.
okay um just one final question i that i have is what's your take on capital punishment because capital punishment is also recognized as a form of killing and uh, but some of Uh, some people or some peace activists or scholars do not agree that capital punishment uh, should be abolished because uh, it's a punishment to deter crime well this this question says a lot about the first question which is what's the difference between peace non violence and non killing in non killing there's no killing no killing is an option and of course that would that we would include preparation for war and it includes the death penalty um regarding the death penalty i think there's some very interesting facts that we need to look at one is of course the shift that has been taking place over the past two decades now um sorry if i go back to glen page but in his book non killing global political science uh in the second chapter there's a there's a whole discussion about death penalty and when the book was first published in 2002 there were 73 countries in the world i believe that have abolished death penalty completely now uh almost um 20 years have passed since the publication of that book and now it's over 114 countries of that have completely abolished the death penalty so there's a very continuous trend of countries deciding to abolish the death penalty completely now this is very significant because as as students of law and and of course faculty you're familiar that the one of the uh, traditional definitions of the state um has to do with the state as having the monopoly over the exercise of lethal violence as one of the uh, one of the um, characteristics of the state and of course the states now renouncing the, to to the death penalty so renouncing the, their right their sovereign right to execute their own citizens is a very important non killing shift uh that affects this basic principle of of the state and this the reasons behind that is basically evidence and the evidence suggests and the studies that have been coming out since more than 40 years ago suggest that the death penalty is not working is not effective as a deterrent of uh serious uh crime and that's the main problem so in the US it has been more than elaborated that the death penalty is not has 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 no uh predictive uh it, it is not working in terms of of a, a, as a deterrent on the other hand the death penalty has also been proven to be very problematic because there's some too many mistakes of people being executed which had later then proved uh not to be um uh, responsible for um for the the crimes they have been punished about of course justice is not infallible and justice can um have uh, very serious mistakes and which in the case of the death penalty cannot be reversed by any means and of course a third issue which has also especially in the US has been a subject of much debate is the costs of the death penalty for some countries and the criminal justice systems in, in some countries may lead to prompt uh, to to fast executions but in other countries um legal guarantees will usually involve uh, long um periods for revision of sentences and involving usually having inmates in the death row for very very long periods of time with very costly legal procedures of revision uh which also doesn't doesn't sustain one of the other traditional arguments in favor of the death penalty which is that of um uh being let's say a um a cheap solution for the state instead of uh longer prison sentences that would place uh, a greater economic burden on the state to have to keep people in prisons for for longer but at least in the US this has also shown not to be the case and this again has to do not with just with the death penalty but with the need to to have evidence based solutions so it's not just that we think that a solution is good 
because of our cultural biases or beliefs, but actually that it's based on, on factual findings. Uh, this is the same for violence prevention strategies. There's a lot of violence prevention interventions that have been designed that we know that they work, uh, but they have to be based on evidence of things that actually uh, work. And, and the interesting thing of a non-killing approach is that because we're systematically globally measuring homicides, because bodies are something you can usually count, this shows if our interventions make sense, if they're working, if uh, in one year our policy changes or educational interventions um, work. And if we have time, I can give you a few examples of that. But let's, let's see if there are more questions. But you can see I'm not in favor of the death penalty, particularly not only in moral grounds, but particularly on, on factual grounds of it not actually working as a deterrent. That's, that's my, my take on it. Yeah, I got that. Uh, so uh, can you just briefly point out the types of killing? Uh, I mean, there are different types of killings which uh, we have also recognized, like genocide, homicide, capital punishment, and uh, suicide is also being discussed as a form of killing. Apart from this, there is, is there any other kind of, and the war deaths, of course. Apart from this, anything else would you? Well, I think, um, of course, scientists in particular, we love to make categories of things, taxonomies. But I think what's interesting about all of this and including other forms of non-lethal violence, it's what is common. And usually as scientists, we like to, and sometimes as policymakers, we like to make divisions. So we talk about domestic violence, we talk about violence against children, we talk about violence against elderly people, school violence, um, neighborhood violence, gang violence, uh, police violence, um, warfare, international war, uh, civil wars. But I'm interested in what's common and what, what's underlying all these forms of violence, even when they're sublethal, when they do not reach um, by fortune or by uh, the intervention of, of, of uh, health services that they do not reach the point of being lethal. And I think we really need to refocus sometimes to understand the underlying reasons why either in, in, in the, as an intimate partnership or as a global society and how states relate to each other, we tend to assume that violence works, that violence is a, is, a, is a legitimate form or an appropriate form or a viable form to address human conflicts and to manage uh, human conflict and to resolve them. I think this is the underlying issue. And as we see, it's very complex. It has to do with many things. It has to do from, from, from how uh, early childhood is lived and experienced and how that affects brain development. It has to do with our cultural assumptions as a society, what we learn in schools, what we learn in families, what we learn in history books. It has to do with our visions of the future, right? Of what we, what, what we think, what we feel as a society that the future holds us and therefore uh, where we're going to put our efforts in the present. And it affects our understanding of um, um, punishment and how do we manage these situations, and how we really need to maybe distance ourselves a bit from moralistic approaches to solve human problems, which is the way we have mostly addressed violence to evidence-based scientific solutions. If you think of medicine, uh, there has also been a very significant change over the past 150 years. Uh, if you go back about 200 years and you look at medicine, it was a lot to do with uh, bad humors, evil spells, spirits, and in the West, uh, you would put people with leprosy in dungeons because they were bad people. Or uh, so it was a very moralistic approach to that. And this was, of course, because we did not understand 
how disease happened. We had no knowledge about the microbiology of bacteria or viruses. We didn't have an understanding of how diseases operated and therefore our solutions were not based on evidence. They were based on moralistic interpretations. I think we have the same problem today with violence. And we're addressing violence based on moralistic principles that are very much aligned with our cultural norms and assumptions, but are not necessarily consistent with the evidence of how violence actually works. And the public health approach to violence prevention has a lot to do with this kind of overcoming this moralistic solutions to violence and bringing about more evidence based scientific approaches to address uh, problems um, that can be solved. And we know that there are interventions that can address problems very effectively, as long as we're, we're, we're working on the basis of evidence and not just of our ideas and our social yeah. beliefs around how violence operates. That's the kind of shift that happened in medicine around 200 years ago. And it's the shift which is really needed today for us to address violence, both you know, starting from intimate partnership violence to uh, international war. And uh, it, it's the same underlying assumptions which are basically um, justifying the continuation of, of this, uh, of this uh, current uh, pandemic or disease, global disease. Okay. Uh, Thanks a lot, I have a, I have a question yes. okay. for Dr. Yip. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sir, uh, you have already mentioned about uh, you know the movies which are looking at the uh, the future and they're trying to represent the image of the future being very apocalyptic and full of disasters. I just want to uh, you know know your opinion. That uh, do you believe that the movies of the current time and in this recent past, as especially the video games, have uh, somewhat fantasized the violence as well as killings? And uh, do you see that it has uh, made any impact on the minds of especially the younger generation, which is still, you know, playing the game quite, uh, you know, throughout the day, wherein they are just, uh, you know, doing somewhat like a, a mindless killing of the characters. Do you see any impact that is it is making on the minds of the people? Well, one, there's many issues to this. One is, of course, desensitization and dehumanization and a lot... And one of the prerequisites for engaging in, in lethal violence is, of course, desensitizing us. And this happens with not only with entertainment, but with news. And it's, there's, there's been many proposed solutions for alternative forms of journalism that are able to, to present the reality in, 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 in different terms. Um, the, the question has many, many sides to it. I, I, I talked about David Grossman, this military psychologist, whose work is to get soldiers to kill effectively. He actually wrote a book after the Columbine school killings in the US, which was called Stop Teaching Our Kids to Kill, or Stop Teaching Our Kids How to Kill. That was the title. And uh, he argued that based on, he, is, he's of, he was of course coming from um, a study, criminalistic study on that particular case of school shooting, and he was very much concerned on how um, these students were able to kill in that case so proficiently with, you know, with the ways that I'm not familiar with, but involved so many shots, so many shots target to the vital organs, so many kills per shot and, and so forth, this kind of criminalistic or, or forensic um, um, approach to understand what happened. And he would, of course, also, he also studied that, uh, he also knew that um, many of these particular uh, children, adolescents, have a very long time exposure to one person shooter games. And that was the only explanation for them to be so proficient in the way they, they killed. And of course, uh, this kind of games evolved from an earlier military technology of military simulation, which is, of course, problematic. Uh, is not to say that everybody, you know, that will use any of these games would then become a school killer. That that's, that would be ridiculous. But of course, these games are, have a background of where they're coming from. They were a military tool for uh, simulating combat to uh, better prepare soldiers to kill. So that's that's what they were made for initially. 
uh, it's problematic that uh, entertainment has shifted towards this kind of uh, um, this kind of uh, instruments that really desensitize us on 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 killing, and of course this explains then how um, the, these views emerge. What you say, the views on human on, on on the future, the visions that our societies we have about the future. And this is culture, and this is something that can shift, and hopefully will shift. Um, but it's, 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 and in, fa in fact, I was saying that future, um, futurologists really rely upon the analysis of these images in different moments in societies to understand what their views are. And they really shift. They really shift from time to time. And the views that we have today are, uh, are very problematic. Are very problematic. So, hopefully, in, in years to come, we'll see we'll see different views on the future. Uh, I think there's also a strong reaction emerging on this pessimistic outlook. And I think, for example, some of the youth-led movements uh, around climate change are a reaction to that of being really being fed up with these apocalyptic ideas because it's them who will have to live in that future, and maybe they're not so interested in. In, in, be, uh, in living that apocalyptic future, which uh, their parents have designed for them or have envisioned for them. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Ma'am, we have two questions from Om Sir, I think we should put it out. Uh, yeah. First question he asks is, in which category economy forced killing be put as suicide rates are on high? Uh, um, sir, uh, could you yeah. could you re, re, could you say the question again? I didn't quite. Uh, is Om sir here? I okay. Uh, the question is in which category economy? A while. Uh... Yes, sir. Yeah. So the first question has already been answered by the sir, uh, like that question was posed long back. So that has been covered very well by sir. Uh, the second question is bring balance of interest, out of concept put under the category of killing and the theme which is just a, a minor doubt which I have. The first question has been very well answered by uh, the sir long back. Okay, thanks. So I, I lost part of it. it. It was cut, so I could I could yeah. hear. So can you, uh, Om sir, can you repeat your question because your voice was breaking while you were asking the question? If you may please ask the question again. I think his voice is. Uh, I think, sir, your voice is still breaking. We cannot hear you, sir. Uh, his discussion. The second question is, considering balance of interest, is it rightful to consider abortion out of consent put under the category of killing and and the theme which is being discussed? Okay, I, I, I got it. Okay, thank you for that. Now, uh, there are Ma'am, the question yeah. is there in the chat box, if you can just convey it to sir. Yeah, it is done. Yeah, yeah. So the question is about abortion, if I understood correctly. Yes, okay. Yes. So there's two gray zones, which are very problematic. So one is when abortion, so it has to do with all the discussions about when life starts, and the other one is it, euthanasia. So how, how, how does life end? And they're both very problematic discussions. Um, uh, very problematic. And this is because the Center for Global Non-Killing is very much aware of these two issues. And we usually try to avoid them because it's it's not at the core of our mission. We're more mostly uh, interested in, in the, the, the 1.6 million um, killings that take place every year uh, outside of that gray zone. But I understand it's very, it's too, it's very problematic because there is no agreement 
um, in this ongoing discussion about when life starts and when life ends. I think we, we would find that in the case of abortion, which is the one you're asking, um, I think um, there's a the, the one key issue is that uh, people, uh, and mothers particularly, should be able to, to have their children in, in safe, nurturing environments. And I guess it's the absence of these environments what, uh, of course, leads to this, this very traumatic experience. I mean, even proponents or defenders of abortion acknowledge that uh, abortion is not uh, an experience that is, is in any way positive. It's a very traumatic event uh, for mother, uh, for, of course, the unborn and uh, for the wider social circle. And of course, traumatic events are not good. So uh, we will need to work on on this in in the ways which which this is uh, which which this is avoided. But having said that, we're we're not um, we're not in any means focusing on on abortion or end of life issues because they're very problematic in terms of ethical views, um, which which are not not at all solved. So. We try to focus our efforts on, on, on let's say, more agreeable uh, areas of killing, which are, I think, uh, very problematic in global terms and which really deserve uh, attention. But um, this is not to, uh, not to say this is, these are not important issues. Abortion causes great trauma around the world every year, and, and we should find ways to to solve that. End of life issues are also very problematic in terms of ethical, um, the ethical understanding of when, particularly in, in, in under medical treatment. So when when is it enough in terms of medical treatment and when we should let uh, people go? But these are very problematic issues that I'm sure many of us will have personally uh, different views on the issue. Uh so we have one more question. I think we can take this up. Uh, the question is basically, as the UN Sustainable Development Goals fall upon the global community to significantly reduce all forms of violence and related deaths everywhere, what educational measure should be taken to achieve this? Well, um, a few years ago, the Center for Global Non-Killing um, arranged, uh, prepared a conference, which was called uh, Education for Killing Free Societies. And I think it was in 2015, or maybe 14, 2014. Out of that um, conference came a document called the BASA, B-A-S-A, Statement on Education for Killing Free Societies. And the document was put together by specialists from um, education, psychology, anthropology, neuroscience, and has a list of, I think, 15 or so recommendations which are based on evidence, suggesting changes on our educational systems and approaches, uh, and including parenting and early childhood education, uh, to bring about significant shifts. Uh, I would recommend you all take a look at that document. We don't, don't have time to go through all of it, but it, it's really worth looking at. Uh, you can also find it by simply Googling non-killing education. And there's a book mm -hmm. which further elaborated the ideas that came up in that conference. And the, the, <clears throat> the, the VASA statement is also in the book. So non-killing education. And this, for us, is a very, very important question. And education has a very important role in sh bringing about shift to, uh, toward um, society where killing is greatly reduced and eventually uh, eliminated, which is our ultimate goal, which is our vision for the, for the future that guides us in the present. Uh, so uh, I think second question have been covered by Abhishek, sir. It's about asking as, as to how movies can be used to promote non-killing. Yes, well, um, I think we, we all know there are very good movies in, in that can help that have 
that that kind of help raise this critical conscience about um, killing, right? And for example, uh, I'm I'm not an expert in movies, but I I have a few titles in mind that not that are films that are really significant in challenging these cultural assumptions. For example, if you look at if you take war movies, right, which is a very popular uh, film genre, uh, war movies usually glorify war and present views on war which are in, completely inconsistent with lived experience, with what we know from science, what we know from soldiers. If we had soldiers in our families, as I had my grandfather and his stories, it's completely inconsistent. And of course, the glorification of war um, is actually a, a group of, of individuals which are which are um, is, is studying to what extent the glorification of war through film is actually not a crime in, in, in international law. I won't go into this today, but it, it's something worth exploring, and I know that some people are exploring it. And and of course, we can have more realistic. And I think what we would need is. Non-killing is not about not looking at war. We really need to understand every instance of killing, every single case of homicide, of uh, of gang violence, of, of war, warfare, should be analyzed to the utmost detail. So we understand realistically what happens in these contexts and what are the causal relationships behind them. And I think regarding war films, we, we desperately need realistic per, per, uh, portrayals of what warfare actually is in terms of the carnage, in terms of the psychological fallout in individuals uh, and soldiers. And there's wonderful books and there's some good, very good films that show this. And I think these are needed in terms of raising consciences, conscience around what war really is. And this, this is very important in terms of uh, turning people away from this sometimes very easy warmongering and how our societies were very much, because of this glorification that we see in film, that we see in history, to, to consider war as something uh, normal or positive or even beneficial for self and society. And this is, this is delusional and it has to do with the lack of understanding of the realities of war and the realities of homicide, the realities of prisons, the realities of the death penalty. Uh, so uh, we really need more good fiction that, that, that is realistic and that uh, does not uh, present this this glorifying view, which is has nothing to do with reality. Okay, uh, I think Abhishek, sir, you can take over. Uh, thank you, uh, Tatiani. Okay, Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, yes, ma'am, please go. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, sir, for uh, answering uh, magnificently all the questions put before you. So this marks the end of uh, today's uh, session. So uh, uh, let me, in the uh, end, I would like to quote, uh, all beings tremble before violence, all fear death, all love life, See yourself in others, then whom can you hurt? What harm can you do? So with these lines at the outset, I would like to extend my deepest regards and thanks to Dr. Pim for sharing pearls of wisdom from his rich acumen. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation despite huge time difference. Uh, this clearly shows your passion and dedication towards this profession. I also extend my heartfelt thanks to our Dean, Professor Dr. Yogendra Kumar Shirasta, all the faculty members and uh, all the participants uh, present here for their active participation and patient listening. I would also like to uh, thank Dr. Katyani Singh for extending her enormous support uh, in organizing this lecture. Once again, I mm. thank uh, all of you for uh, attending this uh, session. Have a blissful day ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.